being out there catching your fish and doing it the very best you can without having any effect on the environment because it is a real issue now. The way I feel about these black petrels is why we need to preserve them is because how rare and special they are to us, you know. Hi, I'm Cam Speedy. Uh, I've lived on the shores of Lake Taupo for almost 30 years now. And while that's about as far inland as you can get in New Zealand, there's still an incredible link between the centre of the North Island and our seabirds out at the coast. In the 30 years I've spent chasing seeker in the high country, I've come across clear evidence that there have been seabirds in the relatively recent past. Um, and uh, I can take you to places right now and show you burrows that are without a shadow of a doubt uh, related to seabird breeding. They're exactly the same as the sort of burrows that you'll find today on places like Great Barrier Island and probably the same species of seabird but they're 50, 60 kilometres from the coast. There's a lot of historical connection as well. Māori knew them uh, and they named a lot of the places here. Through that, the high country, there's references to titi with names like Mōtiti, Pukatiti, Mangatiti, Ruatiti, Te Umu Titi, Titi Ropenga, Makatiti. All of those Māori place names refer to connection Māori had historically with the seabirds that came in here to breed. This spot we're on now is in the Ahimanawa Ranges, right in the middle of the Manuka country on private Māori land, East Taupo lands. The nutrients that were once here, uh, fueled by seabirds, has long since gone. It's been a hundred years since this forest had seabird clatter in it every summer. If you can imagine thousands of seabirds crashing in through the canopy, loaded with fish to feed their chicks. And those chicks lived here on this beautiful, warm, north-facing slope sunny, warm, warm soils, free of predators. There would have been invertebrates, giant wetters, tuatara, probably kiwis and moa, eagles, all sorts of different critters. It must have been just a fascinating place. And those seabirds went 50 kilometres back to an ocean that must have been just teeming with fish to support thousands, if not millions, of seabirds coming in, bringing nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, other trace elements and minerals from the ocean to here be just the same as a farmer using a top dressing plane to put guano that's been mined off a Pacific atoll um, on his farm to grow his rye clover mixed pasture to grow sheep and cattle. Up we go. There's a cycle being broken, the link between this mountain and the ocean. Um, for Māori that's Tangaroa and Tane. It's sea and, and land, sea and mountain. But those connections are critical ecologically. So it's a bit shitty to start with and it just opens up into heaven. It's only when you start to imagine what it used to be like that you realise what we've lost. Um, it's pretty quiet here today. You can hear a grey warbler, I saw a tomtit before, there's a few chaffinches and blackbirds, but um, nothing like it used to be. Through this face here, um, there's a series of white angular rocks uh, which sort of stack up on each other and there's burrow structures all through it. I think that's why they've survived, because they've got that rock structure to them. A lot of the earth burrows are long gone. So you find the odd one, but these angular rock structures, um, they've lasted the test of time. Uh, Rainstorms, windstorms, vegetation falling over, deer standing on them, um, hunters poking their arms in them. Um, so yeah, we'll just go for a bit of a recce through here and see if we can find them. Here's one here, this is a beauty. This is an absolute beauty. I found this burrow here about 10 years ago. I had a possum in it the day I found it. Um, and I didn't realize at the time it was a, was a seabird burrow. But there are probably 20 on this face. It's, a, it's about an arm length deep. It's got a nice big chamber at the end. Just around to the left, you can feel a little chamber. 
And um, once upon a time, you'll probably be able to pull out some seabird poo. Seabirds were coming to this site for millions of years before man brought predators. Um, and in just a short century, we've snuffed them out in millions of years of evolution. And um, their whakapapa back to places like this is broken by the introduced species. The stoat, one, one animal, can do so much damage. There's uh, no stoats on Great Barrier Island, which is uh, perhaps the reason why there's still a breeding colony there. Clearly stoats have wiped a lot of things out of um, forests like this around New Zealand. Um, but seabirds are not suffering the same sort of threats that they used to suffer. They've reduced from billions down to millions, and in the case of the black petrel, thousands, because of habitat loss and predation. Now, one of the biggest threats is fishing. Um, humans and black petrels feed together at a critical time of the year when the black petrels are breeding. So um, they're pretty uh, busy trying to catch a feed for their whānau, just like the rest of us during that summer period. And that interaction of, of fishermen and birds becomes an issue for a bird that was once so widespread but is now so limited. Fishing is a part of the future of seabird management in New Zealand. We've got to get that right, but there's definitely a willingness from the current crop of fishermen we've got out there at the moment. From the day that I started fishing, the attitudes have changed. Younger fishermen coming into it, keen young fishermen, and a lot of these young guys that are starting now are very conservation-minded, and the new generation have been brought up to respect what we've got. They're here for the long haul for their kids. As fishermen, you know, we take an interest in what's happening in our environment, you know, dolphins, whales and seabirds. Seabirds are a big part of it. When we walked up the hill, you know, we suddenly realised that we're in amongst black petrol country. We've climbed so high and slugged their butt off getting up the hill, and here's these seabirds at altitude, and how despite the challenges we've thrown at them, they're still surviving, but they need help to continue. You realise the importance that we have to place on the conservation of these birds. So basically, when, when you put your put your, your hand in, yep. of course you're not going to see anything, you're feeling around and the bird will basically chomp, chomp your finger. And the easiest thing is once he's chomped your finger, is to twist your hand round and using your fingers and your thumb is to close his bill on your hand, on your finger, and then just slowly walk him out. Right. Okay. Sounds really easy and it usually it is. This is the burrow here, just be careful you don't slide down the hill because it does go to a sudden drop off that end. So and just, so just you should be able to look all the way back. Oh uh, yeah. So there's a big fluffy chick or a big Yeah, it's a fluffy one. Right, so then you just need to grab that guy out. <laughs> Maybe the old arm's not not yeah. long enough. <laughs> oh he is very fluffy. And just close his wings in. So. Just want to test the bite out. <laughs> no. no, and yet yeah, it's like, whoops. I just need this foot. You keep that foot. And so, so the band just slides oh, yeah. up and down nicely. Very good. Just be don't too, be too casual with the head. Make sure you hold it because else he might get a piercing. He does. Yeah. The, and you can see, you feel his belly, see how fat it is and full yeah, it is? Yeah. Water balloon, we call them, because right. parents just fill them up with squid and fish. Half downy. Half downy, yep. Just make sure that his wings go in with him. <laughs> so, so how yeah. often do they feed the chick? They can feed them every night if they foraging close, but usually two to three, yeah. three to four days. So they're following yeah. the food source, the richest food source? Yep. Those, all these, and some of them though seem to be going to a, a site that they've always gone to. You know, West Norfolk Ridge seems to be one that a couple of birds really love it. That's every time we put a logger on them, they just go there. So they've obviously got a spot that yeah. they know they get the right food at. And they do a lot of shorter trips when they're feeding chicks. A lot of their trips are a bit shorter. When they're incubating eggs, they can actually be gone for 18 days. It's usually five to seven days as an incubation stint. Yeah. But what we found in that early period, you, they do one short trip and then one long trip. You know, so some males migrate, you know, forage for 18 days our way and the females sitting on the egg. Mm. And some of those go all the way to the coast of Australia. Mm. and things like that. So one went up to Fiji, you know, yeah. and foraged off Fiji. Most of the food is squid, so they feed at night bioluminescent squid, so it comes to the surface and they're feeding on the surface. These guys, we put on dive depth 
devices for the first time this year. It was really exciting, got some amazing new data. Um, so the deepest record we've got on diving is only to 16 metres, which was one metre over what I thought they were going to. I thought they'd be about 15 metres, because they're pretty bulky birds. They're not sleek like shearwaters, so they don't really be, uh, can't really swim underwater very well. So they pretty much dive and go down. And most of their foraging is under a metre. So they do lots and lots and lots of dabble diving and little stuff on the surface. And then every now and then they'll do five metres, seven metres, or like this one, just 16 metres. To have the opportunity to, to actually handle a chick about to fledge and to, to be able to help them band them and to see the burrow so deep underground and warm and snug, a, a nice home for them. And it's just kind of really special to be able to hold one. Yeah, it's a privilege really. For Kiori and, and Black Rat here, they impact about between 0.5 and 1.5% of our burrows a year. So, and that will either be taking out an egg or taking out a very small unguarded chick. Cats can vary pretty much anywhere from zero to our very worst year, which was 3%. Um, and that was only once, you know, one year, one occasion. Most years we have no cat predation at all. Um, it's very odd. We usually seem to have it one year, then four or five years later we'll have another couple of incidences and then four or five years later. And that may be one cat has learned to come up or has remembered or something like that. So yeah, yeah. So the land-based threats um, are less than 2% a year usually. We've got 2,000 breeding pairs here. This is it. They're the ones that show the trend in the health of the population. And apparently here on Great Barrier, that trend is showing a decline. Every single bird here in those breeding pairs is important. It's absolutely precious that we keep those birds protected and safe. And what's the nostrils all about? They help process salt. So they can drink salt water and excrete salt through the nose. Really? Yeah, that's how they do it. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. They don't drink fresh water at all. Yeah. Just drink it at the sea. Yeah, it's awesome, eh? It's just incredible. And basically what happens is just this little dribble of stuff comes out. Yeah. And so it's just, but it's highly concentrated salt. Right. So yeah, no, magic. Absolutely magic. Got the number? Yep, 20. When the birds come back from sea, foraging, to come back and feed their chicks, they circle around, identify their launch rock or their tree or their hill shape in the dark and then just collapse their wings and crash back down to the ground so all the way through the trees and then land plop on the ground usually one or two meters away from the entrance of their burrows amazing absolutely magic absolutely magic this is what the claws of the black petrels do when they walk up the rocks they just uh, scratch these grooves in Watching the birds taking off, especially the young ones for the first time, it was pretty mind-blowing. And we had one black petrel come up in the dark and then all of a sudden just take flight from an area where they've been doing it for hundreds of years or thousands of years. And there's only a few, you know, very few people that's ever seen it. And it's stormy, it was quite windy. And, uh, and they're expected to survive all the way to Peru and back again. It's a big ask really for a young bird. And to realise that they, they the, the parents come back in the dark through the thick bush and crash through the trees and land within a metre or two of the of the of that burrow that they've been coming back to year after year to feed their chuck. What's in my mind when I'm setting the gear is I'm basically thinking I hope the crew are doing their job. Getting out of the seat and going back and making sure and drilling it into them, you know, how important it is to mitigate, to adjust the toy line for the weather conditions, to put the heavy weights on. You're aware that birds diving, you need, to, you need to stop them being interested, so you put a series of heavy weights on, get it down, they realise there's no tucker here and, and they'll carry on. You know, we've got a lot of birds, back the speed right off, get the, get the sink rate right down, a few heavy weights and, and you should be right. Um, dark nights, star a worry. Just before the pre-dawn it's very, very dark, hard to see. That's when the black petrels being nocturnal feeders are at their worst. 
We have trialled glow sticks to try and make the tour be effective in the dark. That thing's bouncing around and, and it looks like, like a dance party out the back and it's, especially if it's slightly rough and I think that's, that would have to, they'd have to put them off a little bit there. The mindset is obviously not to catch them and so you, you know you should be doing everything in your power. This trip you know has made me realise how, how important it is you know, help preserve the species. It's, it's, it's our job to, you know, to safeguard these birds. Yeah. It's probably a bit of a hard ask to expect that we'd ever have thousands of seabirds breeding in the Kaimanawas again, but they still do breed on our offshore islands and all of us who fish have a role to play to make sure that our activities trying to catch a fish for our whanau don't impact on adult seabirds trying to catch fish for theirs. We all have a role to play, it's not hard, seabird smart fishing is the thing to do, the kiwi thing to do.